Good morning from Washington. I'm Andrew Tabler, the Martin J. Gross Fellow in the Gedould Program on Arab Politics at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Next Wednesday, May 26, Syria will hold its second presidential election under the decade-long Syrian war. The Bashar al-Assad regime will ensure the dictators, quote, victory by a wide margin for sure. But the issues surrounding the poll, including questions concerning the inclusion of half of Syrians driven from their homes, have deep implications not only for the future of polls in Syria, but evolving regional and US approaches to finding a settlement to the Syrian war. Just to discuss these and other questions, the Washington Institute is pleased to hold this virtual policy, policy forum with a very distinguished panel of experts on Syria and elections. First, Zahra El Barazi is a lawyer and the co-director of the Syrian Legal Development Program. She has an LLM in international law and her work and interest focuses on the issue of international human rights challenges in the Middle East and North Africa, specifically that of citizenship. She has been part of a team at the Syrian NGO the day after researching the concept of future Syrian elections. Welcome. Second, Emma Beals is a senior advisor on Syria at the European Institute of Peace. She is a non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute in Washington and a former visiting fellow of the Atlantic Council's DFR lab. She was the co-founder and editor of Syria in Context a weekly English briefing and Arabic publication. She also has an independent consultant focused on, he's, she's a consultant focused on Syria based between the EU uh, and the region. Emil Hokayem is a senior fellow for Middle East security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, where he specializes in political conflict and analysis, including the wars in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, with relations with Iran and its Arab neighbors, the rise of non-state actors, including jihadi groups in Hezbollah, national security, defense policy in Arab states, and interest involvement of external actors in the Middle East. Vladimir Pran is a senior advisor with the Middle East Division of the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. He advises on electoral legislation and administration of elections. Since 2007, Vladimir has worked uh, on design of electoral systems, um, the delimination of constituencies, voter registration, election regulations, and the use of technology in elections in, in Palestine, Pakistan, Nigeria, Somalia, and Iraq. Hannah Roberts is an election specialist working with IFAS on assessment of Syrian presidential elections. In election observation and assessment, Hannah has been the head of mission for the OSCE in Afghanistan, Finland, Afghanistan, pardon me, in Afghanistan, the, and Deputy Chief Observer for the EU in Kenya, Nigeria, and Pakistan. She has run out of country voting in the UK for the South of Sudan referendum and was deputy in 2005 for voting in Syria for Iraqi elections. Welcome. And last but not least, Well Sawa is a senior political researcher with the civil society organization Itana, which also provides diplomats following Syria with in-depth briefings on most pressing issues coming out of the country on the political, military, and humanitarian levels. He is also executive director of Pro Justice, a California nonprofit that focuses justice and accountability in Syria, and the ed editor-in-chief of the Syrian Observer, an online news service on Syria. This is a bit of a special event for us today. With six people, this is the largest number of participants we have ever had on a webinar. But given the complexity of the subject in terms of technicalities and policies, we felt that it was merited. Therefore, I have asked the participants to deliver five minutes of opening remarks each, followed by question and answer. For those of you tuning in, and I will repeat this a little later on, you can submit questions through the Q&A function on the bottom of the Zoom screen or by emailing policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Our goal is to make this not just a discussion about an electoral farce, which it has been described in uh, many a media source um, and by many a person, but a policy relevant discussion on the polls implications and how they fit into the effort to settle the Syria conflict. So today we'll start with what's actually happening on the ground concerning the elections and developments in Syria, and then we will move towards policy. 
So without further ado, Vlad, the floor is yours. Thanks, Andrew. Um, let me start. I have four points that I would like to make. And I'll start with the first point, which is really, I would like to answer why. Why are we conducting the assessment of this, as you call them, sham elections? Um, because, of course, it appears obvious to many that these elections are not credible, but it's less obvious what are exactly the aspects of the electoral process that would have been substandard, even if the environment would be peaceful. Um, we know that governance and electoral systems are rarely created starting from a blank slate in transitional contexts, and most of the systems are built on the existing frameworks. Our role is to inform what we take to have credible elections in Syria and what needs to be reformed and how. Um, what is that we are assessing? We do uh, assessment of legal framework, constitution, election law, regulatory framework, setup of election administration, rules of candidacy, campaigning, and of course, how the whole thing is implemented. And we are doing this in the context of the emerging transitional framework, which is articulated in Security Council Resolution 2254, which also envisioned uh, the role of UN, which we can talk about more later, about what would that mean, the role of UN. My second point is, I would like to say something, what is the overall problem with the election laws in Syria? Um, the primary framework for political rights and electoral processes in Syria is established by the constitution from 2012. Implementation of uh, elections is mostly regulated by general elections law from 2014. However, there is a number of other laws which either complement the election law or regulate, uh, regulate civil status um, and processes that directly affect elections. For example, these are executive instructions of the government, civil status law from 2007, nationality law from 69, penal code from 49, presidential decrees, judicial decisions, Ministry of Justice regulation of misdemeanors. That is one very important piece of legal framework that obviously is overseen. Um, the key difference between legislative and presidential elections, and we also did assessment of legislative elections, is that the most critical aspect of the presidential election is determined by the constitution. Uh, why is that important? Because it makes electoral reform particularly difficult as it links it to the constitutional reforms. Um, yet some of the key electoral rights that should be protected in the constitution are not. And they're regulated by law or just by decisions of the government or electoral administration. And we see erosion of key political rights in Syria quite clearly um, when they are delegated to pieces of legislation below the constitution. In essence, in a nutshell, the legal framework does not provide a solid basis for implementation of the elections, surprise, surprise, that would comply with electoral standards as they are defined in the treaties and conventions that Syria actually signed. Now, of course, when we factor in 10 years of conflict, the weakness of the electoral regulation becomes even more apparent and because the conflict is completely ignored. Um, in 2006, there was amendment addressed voting of internally displaced people, but it failed to address participation of over 5 million Syrians who are outside the country borders. And that's something my colleague Hannah will talk about. The cherry on top of this legal framework is the presidential term, which is on first sight limited to seven years with limit term uh, to two terms. But there is a caveat. The constitution includes transitional provision which allowed the president to serve two additional terms after the constitution was passed in 2012, enabling al-Assad to remain in position from 2000 to 2028, four consecutive terms. Um, it also enables him to compete in elections managed by the body that he appointed, which brings me to uh, my third topic, topic of electoral administration. Who is running these elections? Elections in Syria are administered by combination of judicial and governmental bodies, uh, and the constitution explicitly grants that mandate to the Supreme Constitutional Court to administer the key aspects of presidential elections, such as candidacy, and to adjudicate disputes. So the authority for running election is really given to the body that is appointed by the president. There is direct relationship between the president and the electoral administration. Uh, the constitutional court is appointed by the president. Supreme Judicial Council is headed by the president and minister of justice, and at the lowest level, Polling officials are appointed by the governor. So the governor's 
of course, are appointed by the president. Um, on a practical level, regarding competence of polling officials, we saw no evidence of proper trainings or management of these officials. We saw only oath-taking ceremonies, which take about one hour and they're folkloric and ceremonial of nature. Um, who, my, four point, uh, my fourth point is who votes in these elections. So in general, every citizen 18 years of age um, is eligible to vote. However, these rights are really linked to the citizenship law, which is defined, citizenship which is defined by nationality law in 1969. Uh, um, there are a few issues there. By law, mothers cannot pass, of course, Syrian citizenship to their children. Uh, Syrian women cannot pass citizenship to their husbands, but ministers of interior can grant nationality and bypass the usual requirement for the citizenship. So a minister can propose cancellation of citizenship also. Syrians, however, cannot abandon their citizenship without permission of the government. So, and we heard many statements about the government engaging in mass demographic changes by resettling Syrians within the country. We haven't seen any of that. We don't have hard facts, but obviously it's politically uh, interesting, interesting topic. Now, how do eligibility rights are codified in voter registration? That is one very interesting point. And in legislative elections, we saw process that it's very, very different than previous processes in elections. Effectively, there was no voter registration in Syria. There was no voters list. The legal framework requires voters list to be updated two months prior to electoral event. However, we saw none of that. Voters lists were assembled, compiled on election day at the polling stations. And we expect the same situation in 2021. Therefore, voter registration numbers, we have absolutely no idea where they come from. We speculate that they originate from civil registry, but civil registry cannot be considered as an accurate record. And I don't think I need to elaborate what was the effect of the war on civil registry. So we had bizarre situation where in 2016, number of registered voters allegedly was 8 million, but in 2020, it was 18 million voters. And to conclude uh, with my last point is how the candidacy is administered and who's running in these elections. There are a number of restrictions, of course, on who can run in elections. They're all spelled in the constitution. Um, for example, to be a candidate, you cannot be convinced of dishonorable felony, uh, which is defined by the minister. Um, you need to have 35 endorsements from the members of parliament. You need to be Syrian resident for no less than 10 years. And um, that would, considering the length of the conflict, uh, disqualify candidates from diaspora or any refugees who fled the war. Um, there is absolutely no transparency in what uh, who the candidates, um, what was the decision of the Supreme Constitutional Court, how the candidates were granted uh, their nominations. We know that three applicants out of 51 were finally accepted, and we know there were six um, appeals submitted to the Constitutional Court, but there is absolutely no transparency how these appeals were processed, nor what was the reason for these appeals to be rejected. So I think I'm well over my five minutes and I will stop here um, so that, that my colleague Hannah has a chance to explain how out of country voting was conducted. Um, we can go into details of the process and what is that we expect next now that the candidacy process is finalized um, and I can answer those in, in the questions and answers. So thanks for now and over to you. Great, thank you. Hannah, take it away. Thank you. So in terms of the diaspora voting, which took place yesterday, overall, there are multiple problems with both the framework and the practice that would need to change if there was to be credible diaspora voting in the future. So in terms of the legal framework, basically there are problems with the way that it excludes and the lack of safeguards that it has. So it confines voting to embassies and makes the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Expatri Expatriates responsible for the process. This raises obvious protection issues in that if we think of the size of the diaspora with two, nearly two thirds of the 8.5 million diaspora in the countries in the region, in Turkey, Lebanon and Jordan, the idea of such a number of people potentially coming to one office site, to one embassy, clearly there are crowd and therefore security issues that could arise. Centrally, the fact Secondly, the fact that it's centralized. If people are living in other parts of a country, it's difficult sometimes to come to a capital city in order to vote. 
Thirdly, not all countries have embassies, so, in sister, so the requirement to be held only in embassies or diplomatic representations can leave voters in countries without that diplomatic representation at a loss. And fourthly, of course, the fact that it's run by the ministry and therefore by the regime, which will, of course, be a deterrent to people who have fled from the regime. A second problem with the legal framework is that it requires a valid passport with an exit stamp. And again, if you have fled from a regime, you may not have that exit stamp and your passport may have expired given the length of the, the conflict that there's been. A further problem is that there's a lack of safeguards. So there's no requirements for information transparency. There's no provision for independent observation of the process or media coverage. There's no provision for making complaints. So that's the legal framework. In terms of what we've seen in practice, for voter registration, it was essentially inconsistent and again, lacking in safeguards. So in terms of the inconsistency, there was different information availability with most embassies putting something on their, on their internet presence, but not all of them. Some countries had different deadlines while most had a deadline of the 25th of April. Some said registration explicitly said that registration was possible after this date. And some made provisions for expatriates in third countries to also come. A second major problem is that there is no provision made for data security or protection of privacy. And without those protections, of course, it enables or uh, promotes the risk of reprisals and rumours. And as I think we're aware in Lebanon, there have been many reportings on this. So the Access Centre for Human Rights has noted the pressure that's been put on people to register, that civil society activists and camp superintendents have been forced to pressurise people to register. There are also other reports of people trying to get identity and other papers from, from the embassy and being obliged to register at the same time. Also meetings being held normally for aid, but then being used to promote registration. And I thought there was one good quote that came out in the media yesterday, I think, where an interviewee said, that people should be protected not only from forced return, but also from forced voting. Another rumor we heard it was in Turkey of people being forced to complete, being told that if they wanted to get their forms, sorry, if they submitted their voter registration forms, they would be pardoned for crimes. So you can see the environment that people, the registration was taking place in. As Vlad has said, with in-country voting, there was no information made public on the numbers registered. And in practice, it appeared to be ongoing rather than something that had a definite end period. And of course, that definite end period is important for knowing how many people would then go to polling stations as a maximum. In terms of the campaign, this seemed to be much more about promoting participation rather than actual political choice. It was only four days long with the campaign start officially starting on the 16th. As I say, it seemed to be about legitimacy through numerical strength rather than through competition and through the reach there was with, uh, with the, uh, the voter registration and polling happening in more countries, with a strong emphasis on patriotic duty. It was also notable that the opposition groups didn't seem to have an effective campaign against the vote at all, with some commentary coming out just late yesterday, but otherwise rather silent. In terms of yesterday's voting, we saw that the procedures are extremely open to manipulation, the list of voters, which, as I say, sets a maximum limit, wasn't always used or was being compiled on the spot. There was no inking of voters to prevent double registration. Ballot boxes were typically unsealed. Uh, people were voting without their passports, as was legally required. Ballots were loose and not standardised. You could see different candidate orders and lacked information, e.g. not even having names on. And there was no sign of any agents who would be a natural check on the process. We'd say that the overall narrative that was coming out from, from Syria was one of high and impassioned turnouts but, and also noting clashes. So there were images, particularly in Lebanon, of these people queuing for over a mile in order to vote, higher turnouts in Egypt, Iraq and Iran. And the numbers being given were rather implausibly high. For example, by 10, uh, sorry, by 10 in the morning that 10,000 people had voted in Lebanon, which doesn't seem to fit the space that was given. Um, again, consistent reports of pressure and intimidation, people being told they wouldn't be able to go back to Syria if they didn't vote, people's names being recorded, photos being taken, threats of violence. 
Conversely, an image that came through very strongly from the Syrian authorities was what was happening in Lebanon with people being attacked when they were going to vote. And we hear that approximately seven people were injured. Um, in term, a final word, just wanted to say in terms of the locations where out of country voting took place, there was no official record that was made public on where it was happening. So we don't know the total number of polling stations. Um, out of the 47 countries where there are diplomatic, Syria has diplomatic representation, it, we counted that uh, voting took place in 41 of those countries in 44 locations. On election day, a member of the SJEC referred to possibly 67 different locations. It's very unknown, but either, it does appear to be an increase from 2014 where it happened in 32 countries, so an expansion in the Arab region and also in countries in Europe. Um, and as we know, Turkey and Germany refused as they have the right to do under the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. And there could be good protection reasons for that, um, which affected potentially half of the diaspora. And there was a strong line and narrative taken against, against that with criticism that it was denying Syrians basic rights, political rights to vote and inhibiting the democratic process. I apologize for going over my five minutes also. Thank you for your tolerance. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, it's interesting because in, in, uh, in doing this um, in trying to organize this, um, this is most, most important for Syrians, uh, I think. We started out with the, those observing the elections from outside and in detail. Um, I've been a personal observer of Syrian elections in my lifetime. Um, and what I heard just now did not sound like a, even a marginal departure from where they were uh, back in uh, 2007, which would have been the last poll that I um, observed. So thank you very much for those thorough presentations. But as I said, the most important thing is about how Syrians are regarding this and, um, and how they see it. So, well, uh, over to you. Um, what, what is the view of your countrymen uh, of this uh, of this of, of this poll and uh, and where things are going. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, um, many people in Syria are trying to um, show that they are interested in in the elections and they um, are hanging banners and uh, they made some. Uh, marches in support of the elections and in support of the uh, Syrian dictator. However, the uh, majority of the Syrian people inside Syria do not have, as anybody uh, knows, any uh, real choice. Uh, never, uh, never the, uh, still, the many people inside Syria in the areas that they have a little uh, space to maneuver, like in Dara, for example, in the south, like in some areas in Homs, and uh, what, uh, they they say that they will not participate in the elections, and they describe the the elections as uh, as a fraud, as as a sham. The opposition, as we know. Are, are united. The external opposition and the uh, internal opposition are united for the first time, maybe in one on one issue. So the external opposition, for example, uh, the National Coalition's president uh, Nasser Hariri described the uh, elections as theatrical, and uh, Riyadh Hijab said that it's illegitimate and it's a reward to the killer. The co-chair of the Constitutional Committee said, uh, described them as, uh, as sham. And they, he said that they will just uh, be another um, uh, hinder uh, to the uh, talks in, in Geneva and to the uh, political process. Muaz al-Khatib, the former president of the coalition, called to boycott the elections. And he even called to boycott the fake opposition in reference to Mahmoud uh, Marai, who are trying to beautify the face of, uh, of the regime. 
uh, Muaz Khatib, we all know, is usually a moderate person, and he doesn't go usually that far, but, but he, he did. Even the Moscow platform, the will, uh, the popular will party, Qadri Jamil uh, is boycotting. The Cairo uh, platform is boycotting. Uh, the internal opposition, the uh, National uh, Coordination Commission has issued several um, positions uh, uh, saying that, uh, describing the uh, the elections as a violation to the 2254 and calling to boycott the, uh, the, the elections. The uh, Hassan Ablazim's party, the Jihad al Shiraki al Arabi Democratic, the Democratic Socialist Union Party, said, uh, uh, issued a statement the day before yesterday, uh, warning people that Mahmoud Marai, who once was a member of the party is and and he he claims to be a Nasserite like the party uh, that he is no longer a member of the uh, party. Uh, even one registered opposition party, opposition quote unquote, one of the new parties that Assad permitted after the revolution, in order to give the impression that there is an internal opposition that calls for negotiation, negotiation with, the regime, with the regime and in a way or another supports the regime. Uh, uh, th th this party, Solidarity Party, led by Mohammed Abu Qasim, uh, uh, decried the, the elections and he said that he will not participate and called his uh, supporters not to. Uh, well, this is not to mention, of course, that uh, the uh, autonomous administration in the Northeast uh, said that it will not facilitate any uh, process for elections in, in their areas. The uh, people in Idlib, about 4 million uh, people in Idlib will not, of course, participate. And the people in the northern Syria under the uh, Peace Spring and the Euphrates, <coughs> sorry, again, will not uh, participate. The refugees, uh, as uh, the lady before me mentioned, the, the, they, they like in, in Lebanon, we all know what happened yesterday in Lebanon. Hezbollah uh, was forcing the refugees, or threatening the refugees in Lebanon to go and participate. And the refugees found themselves in a very awkward situation. They don't want to take part in the elections, but sometimes they don't have uh, other options. And I spoke to some of them personally, and they were in a, in a desperate uh, position. They told me, we don't know what to do. If, if we don't, we are really uh, uh, threatened and we are really scared that something uh, wrong uh, will happen to us. Uh, I will uh, conclude by saying, uh, and a, a point that I see very important. What the difference this time, despite all the similarities uh, between uh, this time and the previous times of Assad or Assad the father, is that there is an attempt now by the government to give a flavor to the elections, to these elections, um, a, a, a Western uh, flavor. The campaigns, for example, the, the use of the billboard, the colorful uh, slogans, the appearance on TV. The Syrian TV is now uh, interviewing the two major uh, opponents of Bashar al-Assad. And uh, these two opponents, one of them at least, uh, found liberty in order to harshly criticize the, the, the government and shows that his program is... Uh, to a good extent uh, different from the program of the uh, government. What I want to say is that we all agree that these elections are farce, but the, the audience this time is different. In the old uh, elections, the audience was the Syrian people. So the, uh, the regime wanted to play, to show the, 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 their play, to show their farce, to the Syrian people in order to give them the impression that, okay, there is a kind of democracy in Syria and you choose me to rule you. 
Now, even this is no more a concern of Assad and uh, his entourage. They know that this is over, but they still want to um, give the impression to the outer world that what we, what's happening in Syria has a flavor of democracy. There are uh, campaigns, there are uh, uh, programs that are competing with each other. So uh, these, these uh, elections are legitimate. The ultimate goal of Assad is, of course, to, uh, to achieve legitimacy and then to be rewarded uh, by uh, helping reconstruction in Syria and then rewarding his people and his allies companies in order to participate in the reconstruction process, something that until now is not uh, feasible only because only of the uh, position of the United States and the Western Alliance, but nevertheless, we see that this is uh, getting softened, the, the, the position is softened, is softening, and uh, many Arab uh, countries, as we all see, uh, are uh, softening their approach towards Assad, uh, led by the United Arab Emirates and some other uh, countries. And uh, we don't know what might happen tomorrow. Until now, the, the process is, uh, is stuck, but I cannot bet that the situation would be tomorrow as it is uh, today. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Wael. Uh, always a pleasure to hear from you. Um, Zahra, um, wondered your impressions, um, and also not only as a Syrian, but also uh, you know, your legal impressions um, and the, uh, with an eye towards um, not only the, the near future, but also future polls. Please, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for uh, allowing me to be part of this uh, discussion, really interesting discussion. So, I mean, obviously you don't need uh, this panel or me to, to mention as you know already Hannah and, and everyone has, has alluded to that the election this month uh, is absolutely nowhere near to, to meeting international standards of what a fair and free election is. Um, and very much, I think, flies in the face of uh, resolution 2254, uh, which, which Valerie mentioned is, the UN resolution, which among other things, tries to set the parameters of, of what uh, a transition to a free and fair election would be. But what I want to do more than kind of look at immediate kind of policy reaction to this election is just ask a few questions about, um, you know, what, what needs to be done um, that we're not having the same conversations again uh, in 2028. Um, it seems that like another election is very far into the future, but I, but just the fact that we will need a new, I think, approach to how we're looking at these elections. Um, not, and not in terms of like the political sphere um, of what's happening, but rather in terms of an actual election. So really the question I wanted to reflect on today, I want us to reflect on today, that if we, um, and by we, I mean Syrians, who want to see a just and democratic country in the future, we're suddenly by magic thrown into a situation uh, where a free and fair election tomorrow is, is possible. Um, are we ready for that? Uh, and what, what do we have to do and, and what do we have to, to, to complete to be ready for that? And I'm not talking about, you know, do we have a valid opposition? I mean, in terms of the actual election process, so are we ready uh, to have to be part of a free and fair election? And what can we do now whilst we are waiting for that, you know, moment uh, of being able to participate in a free and fair election? Other than sit back and despair, uh, what can we do now? What can we learn from um, so, you know, aside from the sham uh, that, you know, Hannah and Wael and, and, and Vladimir already brought up, what can we learn from that? And how can we, as Syrians, try and work to prevent these things happening uh, next time? So firstly, in going back to, you know, Resolution 2254, which among, you know, other things talks about the drafting of new constitution, et cetera, uh, looking at how uh, the UN uh, needs to be involved in uh, the supervision of the administration of the election. And there are many things that we already need to be talking about, even before we, it looks like we're reaching a transition. So most importantly, for example, I would see that we...
think we lost Hannah or it's uh, frozen. Which was a shame she was just getting into the meat of her presentation. Let's see if it resumes. Just a moment. Sorry. Looks like there we go. Is that how we're doing it? That. It was, it, yeah, we, we, were, <laughs> we were anxiously awaiting your next words. Um, <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah. You, yeah. You, uh, so looking at, um, yeah, looking at the how, how we're going to address the fact that we have been in, in such a weak democratic process for so long. Um, the process of non-residence, I mean, Hannah has, has, has spoken about some of the flaws, um, but what can we learn from that? Like what the presidents, uh, what can we learn in terms of how can we make sure that in the future, uh, these people who don't live in Syria are able to, to, to participate in elections? Um, and that already requires work. Um, it looks, it requires us looking at how we may be able to engage with, with stakeholders such as governments of neighboring countries, the UNHCR, uh, to see what role they could play uh, in a future election. Um, we need to be looking at, you know, would an online voting system work uh, that is managed by a non-governmental institution, perhaps the UN. We really need to look at those individuals who are currently undocumented. And you know, there's a major proportion of Syrians who live abroad who are undocumented for one reason or another. I haven't been able to uh, acquire their hoi uh, year. They haven't been able to acquire civil registration documents, et cetera. Uh, haven't been able to go to the embassy to get a passport. We need, there needs to be a process to already start documenting these persons using, you know, different examples that we can learn from presidents in other countries to ensure that these people are able to participate when there is a situation that there is a free and fair election. And these kind of uh, activities and initiatives need to already be started on those hundreds of thousands of people who are undocumented, for example, um, and effort needs to be put into, into addressing these issues looking at kind of the constitutional committee and seeing what role they potentially could play, play especially the civil society block of that committee in enhancing kind of civil civic participation, working with public, looking at um, how, Lem looking at, you know, how campaigns uh, are, are being run, how media campaigns are being run, looking at whether we need to annex already to this potential constitution, what parameters the international community should be playing in a future election. Uh, do we need an annex to the current constitution that's being discussed? Um, these are kind of the questions that we already need to be working on. Do we already need to be working on uh, forming some kind of independent national electoral body? Um, and then also, you know, Vladimir already pointed out some of the, the flaws um, in the actual, you know, not just the way things are being done, but in actual the electoral system and the laws. Um, and, you know, not just the election laws, but things like the media laws. Um, so do we, we already need to be working uh, on a new format that we can introduce and we can offer uh, when, so we're ready um, for, for, for a potential next stage um, that needs to be done in the context of Syria. And we need to be deciding on what's the most relevant and appropriate uh, electoral process uh, that we need to be, uh, you know, adopting. You know, is it participatory election? How can we make sure that this potential election is really covering the diversity of, 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 of the country, potential areas that are not part of the regime. We, we, we're, we, we talk, you know, there's obvious flaws. We need to start seeing how we could potentially address these flaws, looking at the you know, current systems available that we can learn from. And as Vladimir said, some of these problems are the fact that, you know, you, you know, you need to have lived in Syria for 10 years to be able to pass, to be able to stand for election, which is a huge problem now um, in terms of getting genuine opposition involved. Um, people with disabilities are excluded in, in many ways from, from participating in voting. So all of these we need to already have formatted and developed uh, an answer to these flaws ready for uh, next steps. And so sort of, I guess in conclusion, to try and when presented with an opportunity uh, to have a free and fair election, be as ready as possible with the right uh, suggestions and formats and systems and mechanisms that can address some of the flaws that we are seeing uh, today. And obviously, you know, 
saying that not being naive that you know it's going to be a utopian situation where we can just do this but to as much as possible be ready for that day so that's kind of the question that I wanted to to bring up and you know are we ready and how we can be ready uh, for for um whenever the future comes that there is a potential of a free and fair election great uh, thank you so much Zahra and uh, sorry for the tech technical glitch hope it's resolved um, so we want to now make a sort of shift um, from these election specific and Syrian specific um, conversations uh, towards the political and policy realm um, and I've asked uh, Emil uh, Hokayem, uh, uh, who has been working on Syria for uh, uh, probably about as long as I have and many uh, others on this line, um, but also keeps his ear to the ground on what's going on in the region on a whole host of issues. And so um, uh, we've, we've already talked about um, the, what the procedures in the country, what we've seen so far, um, didn't seem like major departures uh, there. We've talked a little about, about 2254, um, just as a reminder to all of you, 2254, which is um, the internationally agreed upon resolution um, that is supposed to be a Syrian-led political process, was, was to involve the, quote, drafting of a new constitution, and then free and fair elections pursuant to the new constitution. Um, and of course, then when it was passed in 2015, it was to be held within 18 months to the highest transparency and so on. That was the law, of, just the law of the land, um, but the, the, the policy or has been the policy of the United States, um, um, as well as European countries, as well as a number of Arab countries um, who until recently um, followed the Trump administration's policies, um, which, uh, which dealt with 2254 and made it a key pillar um, of US policy um, in, in particular, um, uh, uh, concerning support for that process, but also withholding reconstruction funds from Syria until uh, the drafting of the new constitution was complete and these elections could, could take place. Um, Emil, um, based on what you've heard and uh, what you're hearing, um, how, does, how do these elections fit into what's likely to happen in the near future um, on, uh, on Syria policy among uh, America's allies and, and adversaries. Over to you. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, when is the last time uh, election in the Arab world, except you know, Indonesia or Lebanon, you know, a decade ago, or whatever, um, somehow, you know, set the, the policies of of other uh, regional actors? I mean, those elections are not uh, a turning point for anyone. Um, they are for countries that are already convinced of the need to re-engage with Assad, and we can we'll discuss uh, to what extent that engagement is possible and what it can uh, 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 provide in, in return. Uh, it's a convenient, uh, it's convenient validation. Um, in a way, I mean, you know, these elections are obviously, as, as we discussed, a, a, you know, quite farcical for a number of reasons. Uh, but you know what, they delivered something, uh, whereas you have other processes that perhaps are more legitimate, more meaty, that will never deliver anything, uh, possibly the Geneva uh, uh, track, for instance. Um, so if you are in the Arab world, um, if you're in the main capitals, uh, you're focused on the power politics, uh, not on uh, you know, Geneva or the elections per se, et cetera. And certainly, uh, from my own uh, reading of, of regional politics, uh, the sense that Syria's reintegration into the Arab League and embraced by Arab states, it's a matter of time. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the Arab League, week is, is, uh, Arab League is weak, relevant very often, but it does provide political cover for re-engagement. And that's not something to dismiss too easily. Um, if you are sitting in any uh, Arab capital today. Uh, yes, the Geneva talks are sideshow. The US is disengaging. Uh, the EU is divided and the main EU countries that have spent political capital on Syria over the years are looking elsewhere. The, the France, uh, the UK, uh, Germany to some extent. And importantly, just as this is happening, uh, Russia, Iran and Turkey are entrenching themselves even more so 
um, in, in Syria. And so the, the Arab decision making is driven by this reading of power politics. Um, and the troubling aspect is that um, it's the non-Arab powers that seems to have the greater say today in its current and future trajectory, uh, much more than any Arab country. And, and, you know, even though this may not seem that important, it is very important in terms of Arab self-image and uh, in terms of the, the, the desire in, in Cairo, in Riyadh, in Abu Dhabi and, and elsewhere, um, to actually set the tone uh, in, in the Arab world itself. I mean, I would argue that Egypt has been quite engaged since 2014 uh, and has increased its intelligence uh, cooperation with, with, with these, uh, the, the Arab, uh, um, it was the Assad regime. But this in and of itself hasn't led to profound transformations. It's really if the Gulf states jump on board that, um, uh, in, in earnest that, that, that you'll see the, the bigger shift. The problem here is that while I think a political warming is likely, uh, it's still difficult to see what uh, uh, you know the, the countries re-engaging can gain in substance and depth uh, in, in Syria and how re-engaging will give them any significant influence on the trajectory of events there. Now, first let's understand the strategic calculus of the Arab countries, especially the Gulf states. It's not economically driven, I'll get to this in a second. It's, again, it's based on the reading of uh, US uh, policy. Uh, under the Obama administration, uh, 2254, UN Security Council Resolution 2254, basically set supposedly the trajectory uh, for, for the Syrian transition. If you're sitting in an Arab capital, the way you look at this is that 2254 and the 2016 de-escalation process between the US and Russia were essentially an off-ramp uh, uh, process for the US. And that has been the reading forever, is that if you're sending it to Geneva, it means that therefore you're not actually that invested in, in the country. Then under Trump, we saw a level of poli policy disarray and contradiction that, you know, added to that. Um, you know, yes, uh, Jim Jeffrey uh, was uh, was very insistent in 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 preventing uh, the the Gulf states from reengaging with with Assad, but you know they engaged with with him and others because well he was quite convincing in in a room uh, and because of U.S. sanctions and so on. But really, what mattered for for the Gulf states is uh, seeing the U.S twice, at least President Trump announcing a departure of Israel from Syria. And that really contradicted what the US was telling them um, in terms of its overall policy. After Iran, investment in, in the DSDF, et cetera. And so they felt that this aspect of uh, uh, US policy uh, was undermined by the US itself. And so they never jumped in earnest. Uh, on, on that aspect of, uh, of uh, you know, um, uh, US, U.S. strategy. Under Biden, uh, well, you know this better than us, uh, um, and the U.S. Uh, policy review is ongoing. There is a broad sense in, in Arab capitals that Biden himself sees Syria as a marginal distracting issue, especially when it comes to the Middle East, and that most U.S. officials in senior uh, uh, roles today largely want out. Uh, they want in insofar as uh, they want to keep pressure on ISIS and so on, but they, they don't see themselves as prime architects uh, of the future of, uh, of Syria. Also, in, in, in a very perverse way, um, the focus on the humanitarian issues at the moment uh, that uh, Tony Blinken and others uh, are um, you know, very intent on, on uh, uh, raising, um, that focus on humanitarian issue is seen as actually evidence of a lack of interest in power politics. That you know, the U.S. essentially will reach a compromise with Russia or others to keep those uh, access points into Syria open, which actually will come at the expense of you know, greater investment in, in the politics of the country. I'm not saying I subscribe to that reading, but that's how it's seen. And finally, um, if you are sitting in any Arab capital today, uh, you see the Russian role as, uh, as, as central to the future of Syria. Russia is the country that is actually in competition with Iran and Turkey, uh, the US less so at the moment. 
And Moscow itself uh, wants and is courting the Arab states to re-engage uh, Assad to provide political cover for Russia itself, to provide funding. Um, and eventually uh, that Moscow sees that this uh, Arab re-engagement uh, will influence Western policymaking uh, and weaken uh, uh, the current isolation of the Assad regime. So when it comes to the Gulf states, uh, this strategic reading is essential. Um, Saudi Arabia in particular, just to, um, the policy on Saudi was really driven by King Abdullah and Saud al-Faisal, uh, who were two individuals really involved and invested in Levant dynamics who had repeatedly been burned personally by Assad. So this element of personal enmity is as strong as the strategic rationale that uh, drove uh, Saudi policy uh, towards Syria uh, up until 2000, I would say, 70. But King Salman, and to a greater extent, uh, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, they see Syria as a legacy issue. This is not their main concern. This is something they, they carried over from the previous uh, uh, administration. Uh, and the Saudi officials who have handled this issue have either moved on or are extremely frustrated with the Syrian opposition. Um, in fact, it's very difficult to find a statement by MBS or even the current foreign minister on Syria. Uh, um, and and that's, that's quite telling. Now, of course, there are evidence of Saudi uh, Syrian contacts and, um, in, in recent years. Uh, but there, I would say there are real questions about the most spectacular of them, uh, the, the, the assertion a month ago or less than a month ago, that the meeting in Damascus happened between the head of Saudi intelligence and Assad himself and, and Ali Mamluk. Um, I, I, I'm not convinced at the moment that this meeting uh, uh, did happen in the way it has been reported. Uh, and I still think there is a debate in Riyadh about the merits of the engagement with Assad and what returns uh, uh, can be expected. I mean, you know, the Saudi has a, a difficult task ahead of itself. It has adopted the very hardline position, for instance, in Lebanon, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Saad Hariri, it's uh, one time uh, a privileged partner there and Hezbollah, but now is re-engaging with Assad. Uh, for what? The expectation that Assad is going to push back against Iran or that uh, Assad's uh, can somehow contain Turkish influence. Um, no, I mean, you know, the main uh, actor in all that remains remains Russia. And so everything is done to placate Russia primarily. Russia itself, it doesn't seem very involved. I mean, if, if Russia really wanted to convince the Arab world to re-engage in earnest, perhaps it could have convinced Assad to put on a better show during those elections. Uh, which you know looked very uh, uh, unconvincing to even uh, uh, his own allies. Now the problem within the Arab League is that there is no active lobby inside the Arab League anymore against uh, the reentry of of Syria, but there is a very active lobby in favor. I mean, Syria's immediate Arab neighbors, Lebanon, Iraq, even Jordan, uh, wanted to happen, even though all of them realized that. Uh, the returns, the economic returns will be uh, will be minimal, but they actually want to smooth the things if only to have, uh, you know, more uh, bilateral tracks. The problem for Assad is that his best enemy is Assad himself. His, when when uh, Syrian officials talk about the, uh, returning to the Arab League, the way they frame it is that the Arab League is returning to Syria. They are the ones... Uh, uh, it's, it's the Arab world that's making an act of contrition. Uh, Syria has nothing to reflect on. And that kind of bugs a number of Arab officials who say, you know, we want you to give us just one concession, just to say that there's something that uh, we've obtained in, in return. And um, Assad is being very intransigent on that. Now, the re-engagement is not driven by uh, economic consideration. Yes, of course, in 2018, there have been exploratory visits, there have been meetings between economic officials and business people from the Gulf states and Syria, et cetera. But practically quite little has happened. There's no real framework that would reassure Arab and Gulf investors today. Um, Syria today is, is not the Lebanon of the 90s, sorry for the analogy, but however flawed the political, economic, and reconstruction of Lebanon in the 90s was, and it was very, very flawed, 
it looks healthy and uh, and and good compared to Syria today, right? So if you're a Gulf investor, you don't think that you can you know fly to to uh, uh, Damascus and you're going to invest in a project and that the returns are going to be great and you're going to have a great life and you're going to uh, uh, spend your summers in Syria. That that era is done essentially. Um, there are questions about how you re repatriate profits, how you do due diligence, who you have to, to associate with. Uh, you have a real fear of U.S. and EU sanctions, and the Emirati foreign minister certainly uh, mentioned that uh, during a press conference with uh, the Russian foreign minister. But I would say the interesting fact is that um, this new investment law that we saw in Syria, and I suspect Emma will, will address that, the timing, just the day uh, two before the elections, uh, seems to suggest that uh, um, you know the Assad regime is actually thinking in terms of how to make uh, this economic, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, how to make it economically more attractive for Gulf states to to go back. And my last point on this one is that I suspect Gulf states will, in a first step. Uh, announce a political uh, re-embrace of Assad, quite, uh, uh, um, uh, but a very gradual one. But the humanitarian assistance will be uh, their entry point. That they're basically going to uh, 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 seek for a soft entry into Syria, increase our provision of humanitarian assistance, which is not going to be the most controversial thing to do, and really hope that Russia can play a facilitating role. Um, so, you know, I think this is this is going to be uh, the main strategy. It's not necessarily going to be a spectacular re reconciliation. It will large, likely be a more gradual process. Uh, let me end here. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Emil. Um, it was great shifting into that. Um, interesting. We have almost two parallel processes going on. One, the 2254 process, and then there's the there's the power politics, as you say. Um, Emma, you, uh, last but not least, you deal with, uh, with all of this stuff, the power politics, the election aspects, um, a whole host of things. You've been following the, these, both of these tracks very closely. Uh, tell us a little bit about your impressions and, and, and how they fit together. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I will try to be short so that we retain some, some time for- you can, you can go ahead, but we do need to move to question and answer, but it's okay. You can take, make, um, yeah, please. So I know some uh, policymakers were keen to find a, some way to hit this presidential election with a new constitution and for it to be some kind of passable election. But even for the woefully optimistic, it's been obvious from about the time of the constitutional committee sort of stalling at the end of 2019, that there was no way this election was gonna be undertaken under the auspices of 2254. Um, we saw in last year's parliamentary elections all kinds of problems in the process, and we've heard already about all of the huge issues with the legal framework, security, political reform, and all of the masses of implementation of, of new policy and, and laws that needs to happen, even if a new constitution um, was agreed in order to make for an acceptable election. And that's years of work, even just on the practical elements for sort of out-of-country voting. Um, and so Western capitals have been clear on their position about this election and its illegitimacy for some time now. Some of them um, more recently, but certainly um, you know, a reasonable amount of time. So in that respect, there's no new news here. The only real new news, I think, is that we've not seen one lack of an attempt by the Syrian government to allow for a range of candidates or to facilitate voting from those outside of the country. And we had thought that there may be attempts to sort of legitimize um, uh, this as an election. And that would have been a bigger issue because it would have given a pretext for some states to normalize um, or to soften on Syria because of the election. Um, however, they haven't offered sort of even the smallest carrot. Um, we don't know where the path um, Assad is gonna take from here. I don't expect him to become more inclined to compromise or become more benevolent or forgiving as a result of this election. Um, I think it's likely going to be uh, the opposite. So anyone who's normalizing now is not doing it because of these elections. And I mean, let's be honest, those who are eager to normalize aren't really known for their robust defense of democracy in any case. Um, so folks that normalize now, they're doing it with exactly the same regime, if not a worse regime than last year, the year before. And their eyes, I think, are open to that. So in terms of Western policy on the elections themselves, 
Um, I think they're doing the right things now. The position is that the elections must be in line with 2254, with a new constitution, with out of country voting, and all of the other changes that um, others who are much more qualified than me to comment on have, have laid out already on the panel, and with UN supervision. So this election doesn't change much there, that position stands. Um, they're also supporting all of this great work going on to make sure that in the future, if such circumstances exist to have um, a, a better or more appropriate election, then all of that work has been done and it will be an option. I think one of the big policy worries for me as a result of the elections um, is Lebanon. And I think we might see things decline fairly rapidly for Syrians in Lebanon as a result of uh, this election based sort of on what we saw yesterday, but um, there is more to it with regard to kind of the Lebanese refugee returns plan, which was passed last year and seemingly forgotten about by everybody, except those that have been implementing it behind the scenes. And I think some of what we've seen around this election is, is some of that manifesting. Um, and we could do a whole other panel on that. But I think for regional policymakers, you know, from Western states, um, the situation for Syrians in Lebanon is definitely something that would be keeping me up at night and, and I'd suggest should be keeping a lot of folks up at night. Um, I think it would be great as Emil sort of touched on if some containment of Gulf engagement or at least some avenues for construction and constructive engagement were provided. Um, but I think on Western policy more broadly, what's needed is a clear and achievable policy for resolving the conflict. Um, and that sounds, of course, idealistic at this point, because we've got no movement on the political track, haven't for a while, and any policy requires political will and engagement from, from Russia and Damascus. But the mistake is to say that, well, the elections were so awful, we should wait until there's a better time to re-engage. You know, Assad's won, it's going to be seven years, we've got a lot of time here. I'm not advocating for normalizing, because I believe Assad will be less palatable even after winning another term. Um, and I'm not suggesting to move off the ambitions of 2254 and the need to hold back Western leverage to secure that. But there are legitimate concerns from some of the wider region, including the Med, about containing Iran, stemming for the displacement and instability or the ongoing burden of open-ended refugee hosting responsibilities. And those fears won't be alleviated with an extended diplomatic vacuum or strategic indifference or standoffishness. Um, you know, and whilst the election may not have given a precursor for all of that to change, um, it's certainly not a reason uh, to step back. We do need a sensible, well-reasoned step, step approach to resolving the conflict with sensible asks, maybe less focus on process, more on the needs of Syrians themselves, whether that's securing cross-border access, which is going to be essential, um, unpacking the genuine and arguably increasing security concerns to improve conditions, and then eventually securing the pathway for a, what that is laid out in resolution 2254 to the kinds of elections that others have, have spoken about earlier. And I think that that is actually more important uh, than ever. I'll leave it there. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, and thanks to everybody for, um, for this uh, wide ranging um, discussion. So I'm just going to take a, um, a moderator's prerogative, just ask a few initial questions, and then we'll get on to some of those that are being posed um, through the Q&A function. And, um, and for those of you that are viewing, uh, please uh, submit questions in the Q&A function you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and also you can write to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org, and those will then be sent to me, and then I'll hopefully be able to ask them um, to our panelists. So um, let's just start out just, just a few, um, few of them here. We have you know, kind of two tracks to this conversation. One's about the elections. Um, the other one's about settling the conflict. The two things meet in 2254, it seems to me, and that's the reason why um, we're, having, um, we're having this discussion. So for just for matters of comparison, Vlad or Hannah, from what you've seen so far of the elections and kind of particularly your um, out of country voting, how does, how does what we've seen so far or what's stacked up so far, how does it, how does it compare with the other elections that you have observed? Uh, is this, is it the worst? Is it in the middle? Uh, is, are there outrageous things about this that you haven't seen anywhere else? Um, just how big of a farce really is this? Um, I, I know that's a hard question to perhaps ask, but 
you might be uh, better qualified than most to put this in perspective for us. I don't think it's such a hard question, actually, as it's clearly a farce. I mean, with this level of in of lack of safeguards, lack of transparency, lack of a framework, lack of opportunity for people, there's no question that it's it's not fit for purpose for for what's needed for having uh, um, having people be able to express their political opinions and having an outcome that can be respected and seen as legitimate. So I think there's no question about it. Anyone who um, would look in any detail at this can see that it, it doesn't, it, it's not fit for purpose of what's needed. It also contrasts very much with some of the other out of country operation, out of country voting operations that have taken place. So we've seen in the past very big ones, including in Syria for Iraqi elections. So uh, that's one example. Another, as we mentioned earlier, was for the South Sudan referendum, also for Libyan elections. When there's been a very big exercise to provide voting for very large numbers of the diaspora. When there are smaller numbers of the diaspora, it's much easier to, to work out arrangements. But when you have such a a really large diaspora population, clearly very specialist arrangements need to be able to, need to be worked out in order to make it practical for people to participate and to give real opportunity for people to participate so that they have the chance to cast their ballot, but also not to try and avoid some of these intimidations and pressures that have taken place. So in order to really provide for something like that, it needs a lot of work done in advance where there's an overall framework with some sense of sort of international agreement, more of a sort of a wider reach, a wider, a wider global understanding, and then agreements worked out in detail with host countries in advance. So it's clear what's expected and what should happen and an involvement of diaspora groups. So to know their needs and to understand, as was mentioned earlier, things like the actual documentation they have and what would actually facilitate their participation and to involve them so that they're part of the process and can have confidence in it. And then of course, to actually do an operation on a large scale for this many million voters potentially. So it, it's, it's something that would need a lot of planning in advance and a lot of international agreement, which is why the more that there can sort of be a, a broader global approach to it, the better. Thank you. Okay. Um... And then my second question is to Zahra. You had mentioned um, I, what I really liked about your presentation and also my discussions with you is that um, as a member of the Syrian diaspora and opposition, you are looking to the future, um, not to the past, not to the very frustrating and, uh, uh, past and present. Um, how much and, and to what degree is the Syrian opposition um, dissecting what is going on? I mean, uh, we all know, as we've talked about it being a farce, but um, are, there, are there plans afoot uh, to correct this in the future? And if so, by whom? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think, I'm, I mean, I can't answer on behalf of, 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 of uh, the whole population, but I do think, uh, I mean, there is a, a level of, intense frustration I don't you know need to talk about it a level of an you know extreme hopelessness um, that is felt by everybody uh, in terms of you know whatever we do is it doesn't make a difference anyway because the powers that be um, are the ones that are, are regulating everything but having said that I think there is I guess because we've kind of passed a decade we've passed immediate humanitarian response we've passed you know this whole craze of a few years ago of you know reconstruction and we're, we're at a time where okay so so what now um and so I think the strategy is slowly moving towards well we need to you know nothing's going to change tomorrow but we do need to start planning uh for for, for what could be I mean in terms of the election specifically I know there are um there is work I mean it's part of the team uh that I that you mentioned before when reading out my bio with with the day after uh, a big team of people working on looking at envisioning of what an election could look like um, in a free and fair election, for example, uh, in terms of, you know, how does the election law need to be overhauled? Uh, what are we going to do about those who are stateless? Uh, what are we going to do about those who are undocumented? What are we going to do about uh, 
the media law in the country. Um, so, you know, there are projects and, 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 and kind of forward thinking strategic uh, attempt at understanding what can be done. So I think it exists. I think, you know, it comes with with an, a real element of, of, of frustration. Um, but I think there is a change in strategy from response to uh, to to thinking uh, about the next steps. Yeah. OK, and uh, I have a question here coming in from uh, Charles Lister. Um, the 2014 election numbers uh, released by the regime raised a number of big red flags, including with basic math. And I think um, uh, a number of you have, have mentioned this. What should we be looking out for this time in order to sort of uh, dissect or maybe poke holes in this predest predestined result? Vlad, Hannah, Zafra. Can anyone hear me? Hello? So your voice cut a little bit in the question. Oh, sorry, that. sorry about that. Um, just to repeat from Charles Lister, the 2014 election numbers released by the regime raised a number of big red flags, including with basic math. What should we be looking out for this time in order to poke holes in this predestined result? I mean, a quick response to that in my, uh, my very personal opinion um, is that there is so much to poke holes uh, before even the results come out. Uh, in terms of the way this process has 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 been carried out, in terms of uh, you know the lack of observation, the lack of uh, you know exclusivity, all the problems that Hannah brought up. So I mean, I, I think there is no need even to 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 highlight you know additional issues. It, it isn't a, a democratic process, and it isn't a free and fair election, and we can already say that. Um, you know whether they count the mass correctly or not this time. Um, I think it, I think from my personal view, that's where we're at. Um, okay, great. Perhaps, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Perhaps just to add to that, I think it'll be interesting to see when figures come out and what detail they give in those figures. So normally we would want to see the total number who voted, how many ballots were invalid. And we'd want to break down by candidate and by polling station so that you can see that the total that's reached is an accurate total. You can check things. We're not anticipating getting those figures. That's what should happen. But the figures that are announced, of course, then we should be looking at how they compare to the population figures as well to see if they resemble what we know about the population in country and out of country in terms of people who would be eligible to vote in order to, um, to sort of further assess the credibility or lack of in the, in the results that are finally announced. Thank you. Okay, great. Anyone else wanna chime in on that question? I think Vlad's computer has crashed, but he'll be back in a minute. So he'll ah, come in a bit later. All right, great. Um, so this question comes from someone out of the region. Um, and I, I think it's a, it's, it, it's a legitimate question, although I think because we're perhaps jamming two things into one presentation, what, or one is about elections um, and the other one is about, the, um, is about policy. Um, how will this election actually change anything at all, apart from kicking the constitutional can uh, another seven years down the road? In other words, what are the real dangers out of this process that we see? Um, we can see it's clearly farcical, but what are, the, what are the implications or the looming problems that come out of this poll, not only for democracy in Syria, but also settling the conflict? Yes, uh, I, I, I can Please. say a few words here. So the biggest problem will be that uh, Bashar al-Assad will, will claim legitimacy the Russians, the Iranians, the Chinese, and some other countries will uh, validate that 
quote unquote legitimacy. And uh, this will uh, devaluate the work of the Constitutional Committee and the talks in Geneva. It will devaluate the efforts made by the uh, United Nations in order to find a real serious political uh, solution with a transition with a transition political transition uh, and will uh, instead uh, su support and strengthen the other uh, tracks like the the uh, Russian supported Astana and the uh, Russia in, in, in the first place is trying to do its best in order to shift the gear, in order to shift the place and the discussion from the Geneva and the United Nations to somewhere else where Russia, where Moscow has um, an upper say there. So basically what will happen is that every, everything that supports the right of the Syrian people for a future democratic Syria will diminish in favor of the things that will enhance the position of the Assad and his allies. However, if the Western democracies continue to stick to their position vis-a-vis -vis reconstruction in Syria, the position that says there will be no penny paid in Syria before a real serious transition, that might uh, mitigate the threat that will um, uh, strike the Syrian people. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to take a stab at that, uh, Emil? Well, I mean, look, the, whatever we, we think about the election or, or any other tracks, I mean, the, this is the only place where you actually have movement or at least the illusion of movement at the moment, right? This is what Moscow can market around that, okay, the elections were not perfect, but they were elections. Uh, you know, Assad may, uh, uh, you know, it's not gonna go away. So it's not, an, the question of legitimacy is, is a secondary if you're not trying to, to challenge that. Uh, so for the problem for Western country is that, uh, of course, the, the cost of uh, maintaining the isolation uh, are quite uh, low, uh, but the, the, the systems at senior levels are no longer investing in that. I mean, it's not as if President Macron or President Biden or whatever are making, uh, you know, concerted efforts all the time to keep uh, that, that wall in place. I think in, in a way, the, the, the big question in Western capitals at the moment is, to, is, is whether um, the smarter thing is to say, okay, uh, a number of, of uh, uh, Arab states and non-Arab states will re-engage uh, Assad, but these are red lines. Uh, you can actually have some political discussions, but we don't accept uh, security discussions, or we don't uh, want you to re-engage in anything, uh, any large uh, 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 reconstruction real estate project and so on. So, you know, just moving the, the, the parameters a little. I mean, I'm not necessarily advocating this. I'm just saying that it's very easy to put out a statement by an unknown spokesman at the EU or whatever once a year to say, you know, we stand by this. I mean, Josep Borrell did it, did it. He's not a, a, an unknown uh, a spokesperson for the EU. He's quite senior just a, a month ago. But there is no policy ownership of this issue. It's, it's seen largely as a legacy issue, including in Washington, uh, Andrew. I mean, I don't know if you agree with me on, on that one, but it's like, it's the thing that we're dragging, right? I mean, you and I may not be happy about it, but let's be realistic about it. In Arab capitals, the problem is really today the illusion that Russia can deliver something, that Russia will contain Iranian influence, will, will, will discipline the Turks, uh, will will get Assad to uh, uh, secure possible investments there, will make sure that not 90% of humanitarian assistance is diverted, only perhaps 50%, and they can live with that, right? So much is invested in that. And at the same time, Assad himself is, doesn't have to do much. 
I mean, of course, he wants this re-engagement because symbolically it's important for him. Uh, Security-wise, I mean, it's, you know, he's basically telling Syrian expats uh, and, and refugees across the region that, you know, and the opposition, uh, no state is really supporting you in the region, so be careful, uh, keep quiet, uh, no longer uh, organize, no longer mobilize, and so on. That's quite important for him. Um, but primarily, it's all, of, again, it's about placating the Russians. Uh, and the question is, is there something to do with Moscow on that? I mean, some people have put out very ambitious proposals. Others uh, have a more step-by-step -step approach uh, uh, or are recommending a step-by-step -step approach. It, you know, it's very unclear that any of this will lead to, to anything tangible. Uh, but unless Western, and especially US policy clarifies and there are clear uh, uh, incentives and punishments on the table, uh, I suspect we'll be living in this purgatory for, for, for some time. Right. Um, Emma, you want to chime in on this? I was just going to say that when you consider the scale of the um, legislative, constitutional, um, bureaucratic changes that would be required to have an election that was, you know, deemed suitable under sort of the auspices of 2254 and for legitimacy in terms of, you know, uh, any sort of negotiation regarding concessioning. There is no reason why that would not be able to be sooner than seven years. I mean, the bar that we're talking about is very high. So if you were going to meet that bar, it's not so much would have sort of had to happen or change and the negotiation would have had to progress to a point where you are actually talking about quite a, a big um, set of agreements that would mean that you weren't necessarily married to the time scale of waiting another seven years anyway. Um, and so I think that that's sort of the balance, you know, the seven years is... Um, if, if the changes are sort of very incremental or, or, or so on. And so I think we, we don't, we shouldn't be shy about the, the, just the sheer size of the challenge to actually have an election that um, makes sense under these. And, and the fact that if that was possible at any point, um, which others have taken a view on, on, on whether that is likely would, um, mean that we're not necessarily married to those time scales anyway. So that's sort of also an argument that we didn't, you know, stepping back and waiting for those seven years doesn't necessarily um, <laughs> have to follow from um, the events of next week. Right. Um, yeah, I think, you know, in looking at this and listening to your answers uh, and, and thinking about that question, um, I think that the, the danger here or the, the, the um, cause for pause, in my mind, um, is that, you know, we, we all, a number of us on this line met when I was last in government, we discussed about whether this was going to be viable or not anyway. Um, we all decided that it was not going to be, and Emma, you spelled it out very well, these things take a long time. Uh, IFAS, you, you know how complicated that really is. I, I think that the, the danger of this, what, what this poll shows, to me is just, it's amazing how much things in Syria haven't really changed in this regard on the political process. And I think that reflects then on progress on 2254, right? And so there is a, there, 2254 supposedly is what we all agree on, including the Russians and everyone else, including Iran, on how to settle the Syria crisis. But, but the regime with Russian and uh, sometimes, and to a large degree, Iranian support, had a, had a plan B, and their plan B was to continue the war, gobbling up some territory, which we saw in Idlib until A, COVID hit, and B, the Turks uh, fought back uh, in the areas in which um, they were, um, you know, in, in which they were stationed. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, um, uh, we had the, um, the, the U.S. Um, continuing the isolation, I think the danger here is, is that it's a sign that, that, that things are not moving forward. And, and what I think worries me is that, at least if I'm hearing it from Emil and the number of you are saying, is that despite these lack of changes on this issue, 
it doesn't sound very different than the last election I witnessed in Syria, where the young lady running the polling station tried to vote for me and another American journalist who was with me. Um, just for the record, I'm not a Syrian citizen and didn't claim to be and did not vote. Um, um, but I, I think the um, I think the danger here is that I'm hearing that the Arab countries are going to. It's not just the Arab countries. Or some of them are going to re-engage with Assad, but that the U.S. is going to go along with this supposed wave of sentiment. My question is, uh, and I think, what is this really going to get? Um, and so in order to poke into that, um, and I'm going to ask Emil, but anyone can chime in on it. Um, what are we, what's going to be the, what's going to be the next moves here? Um, we're going to have these elections. Obviously, Assad's going to win. Um, uh, we're going to probably have a little bit more mayhem, perhaps, in some neighboring countries, or maybe even in Lebanon. But what's the next move here, Emil? I mean, um, uh, what are we likely to see? Uh, what kind of um, uh, what, what kind of assistance, humanitarian or otherwise, are we likely to see um, extended to Assad? And and what do we what do we think they're going to try and get in return? Well, I mean, look, the the reality, if one wants to be fully honest, is that um, if you continue with the current strategy of isolation and so on, things don't improve for Syrians inside Syria. And if you re-engage, they probably won't improve either. Uh, I mean, I think this, uh, you know, broad, unconditional uh, re-engagement and so on. Um, so, you know, there's no reason to expect that any new strategy will deliver, uh, you know, significantly better outcomes for uh, average uh, Syrian uh, civilians. The problem was when the conflict was at its highest, uh, that some countries decided that power politics or trying to shape the battlefield, etc., was not worth it, that it was too difficult, too expensive, uh, and so on. They may have, have been right or, or not, but... That was the calculation back then. For, for Assad and, and, and the supporters, the strategy is quite crude. You, you shape the battlefield first and foremost, and then you expect everyone else to adjust to that. And you don't need to do much more. I mean, you know, the, the next French president and the next German chancellor and the next UK prime minister and so on will be even less attached or, or invested in this issue than the current ones, right? I mean, look at where the debate is going in Germany, uh, you know, in, in the UK, it's not as if, you know, Boris Johnson or, you know, who once thought that Assad was the better, the, the lesser evil and so on, uh, is, is necessarily driving a, a new thinking on that. What sustains the current policy are, uh, uh, you know, diplomats who have been invested in this issue throughout the decade, uh, but political leaders have, have moved on largely. Uh, and I don't think this is going to, to, to change massively. Now, the reality is that at the moment, Assad himself is quite in a comfortable place. Uh, he, I, I don't suspect, I suspect that he doesn't necessarily think that he can reconquer everything tomorrow, but that's really not really the objective immediately. Uh, he doesn't have the resources, he doesn't necessarily have the manpower and so on to take Idlib back, Northeast Syria back, uh, and, and so on. He actually needs uh, this conflict to remain a, con a frozen conflict, to play the Iranians against the Russians, to avoid some of the hard decisions and so on. I think if he really wanted to make some progress, I mean, even those elections could have been uh, manipulated more smartly than they've been. Yeah, I mean, there were ways to actually get a bit more legitimacy by playing it differently. But what we saw was that he doesn't really care about, about those issues. Right now, the key for Assad is to make sure that there is no existential challenge uh, to him. And that's what it is. He essentially has neutered uh, any op uh, significant opposition to him. And I don't think the Syrian opposition or rebellion are potent forces or cohesive forces anymore. And regionally, no one is ever going to invest the resources that they existed five, 10 years ago uh, to, to challenge him. So he's not, he's not thinking about stabilization the way we would think about stabilization in other contexts, okay? That's not where he's going. He, has, he knows he has limited resources and those limited resources need to uh, be directed to the, his core constituency. And that's what it is today. Uh, 
you know, if you're Assad, you're probably looking at those surveys that show that, what, 65% of Syrians residing in, in the Damascus province want to leave the country. And you say, you know what? Fine by me. It doesn't really matter as long as they don't organize and, and, and pick up a weaponry. Uh, and I'm confident that my allies will not let me down. I think that's the extent of the political sinking in Damascus today. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, yeah, I think you've answered that very well. Uh, I'm just trying to think um, how, this is, um, how this is all going to work. Um, uh, some of the things that you're mentioning here, um, I, I could understand, I, you know, I think one of the main considerations, um, and we have, here we have a question about what the Biden administration's policy should be post-elections, and um, and what are the options? We're unfortunately out of time, so it's very hard to get into that. But I think the thing that that strikes me the most is, um, you know, if I was an Arab country, granted, I don't, um, I'm not really that. Con as Emma pointed out, I'm not. Uh, Gulf countries not that exactly concerned about democracy. Uh, clearly, can afford to dump money into a country and not get a return, but. Don't think anybody really wants to have an uh, egg on their face, so to speak, yet again from Assad, who's famous for um, taking something and giving you nothing. So um, I just what, what I what I fail to see here is that what what the conditionality would be with this engagement. What are we really going to what would are we really going to get? Because it seems to me that breaking the isolation is the major concession from Washington, and it seems as if Washington is signaling that in the sense that while the US is not going to be engaging with the Assad regime, it's going to allow its wealthy allies to do so instead. And I'm just wondering, how is that all going to work? To my panelists, the last question that we'll have to end, do we have any idea about what's going to be put on the table or how that might work? Or is it still as mysterious as the policy review itself? Okay. I don't hear anyone. Emma, I know you want to chime in on this. No. <laughs> okay. Um, well, perhaps then we'll end with that um, important question, and we can always talk about it offline. Um, but uh, thank you to all of my panelists for your time, your consideration, your, uh, your, your hard work. Um, this was a hard thing to pull off, uh, to talk about uh, uh, an election and all the technicalities and policy at the same time. But we will circle back uh, in the not too distant future. We're going to be having an upcoming policy forum with my uh, colleague Charles Tepo on cross-border assistance and the looming vote with Russia and the next test, public test, uh, that be it, be it uh, for the Biden administration's new Syria policy. So thanks very much to everyone, and I hope to see you.